So today we are, um, we're starting a series on the biblical command of Sabbath. Sabbath in Hebrew literally just means to cease or to stop, to rest. And it is a deep, rich, life-giving invitation to let go of our anxieties, to to put aside all the work, all the doing, all the achieving, all this endless wanting, and just rest, just be with God, just enjoy Him, just delight with Him, just delight in His creation, delight in others, just enjoy being who God has created us to be. It is such a simple and beautiful invitation that is echoed in Matthew 28, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest It is so simple, so beautiful, but if you actually try to do it, like if you actually try to take 24 hours off each week and just rest in God's goodness, you will likely find that it is terribly hard to do in our culture. So with our remaining time, um, just in preparing for where we're going to head in the weeks to come, I want to I want to look at a biblical image that helps explain this experience. That helps uh, put words in how the Bible would look at this. Why is it so hard to rest? The Bible actually has a story that kind of should, that populates this. That wants to tell us why is it so hard to rest. This isn't just a psychological thing. This isn't just a cultural thing. That there is a spiritual reality going on here. And our text for today is the book of Exodus. We're going to start in Exodus chapter one. Um, here's the situation. Here's the story of why it's so hard to find rest. God's people, the Israelites, they're enslaved in Egypt. This is, uh, just down, you guys know where Egypt is, pyramids and stuff, right? They had come to Egypt from Israel just around the corner. They had come down to Egypt to escape a famine. And it was a little bit awkward because the Egyptians despised the Israelites. They called them Hebrews, which was like a racial slur. Those Hebrews were like bearded and guttural and smelled like sheep and stinky. They didn't like them. They didn't want to eat with them, didn't want to be around them. So life, um, it was a bit awkward, but life wasn't that bad at first. Because the Pharaoh had a relationship, a covenant relationship with this guy named Joseph. You may have heard of him, had a technicolor dream coat. So it worked out pretty good for a while. The Israelites ended up taking the jobs that the Egyptians didn't want. They became sheep herders and God blessed them. So their numbers grew and grew and grew. And we don't exactly know when, but at some point there came on this new king, a new Pharaoh who raised up and he knew not Joseph. He did not have a relationship with Joseph or these Israelites anymore. And he was not a fan of all these Israelites running around. So we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 1, starting verse 11. So they, this is the new policy of the new Pharaoh, they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. So context here. At the time, Pharaoh was, by almost any account, the most wealthy, uh, the, the wealthiest person in the world. But what's the wealthiest person in the world need? More stuff. So he sends them out. He, he forces the Israelites into slave labor because he wants more. He forces them to go board, build store cities so that he can save up more and more and more. Like they must serve his, his endless accumulation of more stuff. That is why they exist now in that world. Verse 12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. God's blessing them. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all the harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So so Pharaoh, um, if you know anything about ancient Egyptian culture, you know that Pharaoh believed himself to be a god, or at least the son of a god, a kind of like this sim- symbolic guy who believed that he was like the god of, of, of Egypt, the god of all the earth there. He is the god of the world. And these Israelites, they are nothing to him. They are tools. They are less than animals. They, 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 their whole purpose in life is to serve his needs. So remember, Genesis chapter 1. God, when he makes the heavens and earth, he works, he works, he works, and then he rests. So work was good, and he made humans um, uh, He made humans to serve, to, to be in his image. So they were to work the way he worked. But Pharaoh takes that, and he turns work into pure pain. It is dehumanizing. It is unending. It is um, anything that is glorified or good in work is, is removed. And notice... 
There can be no rest in Pharaoh's world. Pharaoh's world is not incidentally, it's shaped like a pyramid. He sits at the top, him and the gods, and then he has his like officials underneath him, and then the slave masters, and then at the very, very bottom are these, these people who are not even worthy of being called people, the Israelites. And his desire for more never stops, so they can never stop. Because if they ever stop serving his desires, well, his greatness will be threatened. So in Pharaoh's world, the Israelites are only worth what they can produce. In fact, in the next chapter, we're going to see that he so devalues them that he, um, he tells all the women to take the baby boys when they're born and throw them into the Nile. He throws them out like a piece of trash. These children made in the image of God. Fast forward to chapter 5, and one of those baby boys, though, gets rescued out of the Nile. And he grows up to become the man we know as Moses. God shows up to him at a burning bush, sends him back, says, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to set my people free. I want you to go free my people. We pick up the story in chapter five. We see this. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. I want you to get what's happening here. The God of Israel is telling Pharaoh who believes himself to be the God of the world, to let his people go so that they can worship him. God wants his people to stop working, to go meet him, to to stop working, just to be with him, to worship him, to be in relationship with him. So what happens when God's people want to stop working so they can just go be with God? What happens is, is Pharaoh, the God of the world, loses his mind. Verse two, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. So what happens when God's people want to stop their work so they can be with God? Pharaoh denies that God has any authority there, and then he demands they get back to work, and then he's going to pull out all of his tricks, every trick in the book, to make sure he keeps them enslaved and under his control. Follow this, verse 6. The same day, Pharaoh gave this order. So the exact same day that this happened, he wants them to see the connection. You just asked for time off. Now, this is what's going to happen. The same day Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. So what's the first thing Pharaoh does? In order to keep them enslaved, he keeps them stressed out. He knows If he can just crank up the stress enough, if he can make them physically and emotionally exhausted, then he owns them. If they are overworked, exhausted, burn out, those people are easy to manipulate, easy to control. They will give in. So he keeps them stressed out. The next thing he does is this. He says to them, they are lazy. That is why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Do you see what he's doing here? He makes them think that rest is a weakness, that it's a character flaw, that if you want to rest, you must be lazy. It's a character defect. If if you devote your time just to delighting in God and enjoying his creation, you are unproductive. You are lazy. He labels the worship of God, resting, celebrating, as a character flaw or a weakness. Verse 9. Make the work harder for the people so that they, they keep working and pay no attention to lies. You get what he just did there? He just called the invitation to come with God, to be with God, to celebrate God. He called that lies. What does he say to them? What's the, 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 the principle here? He so fills their lives with noise Make them work so much that they can no longer hear the truth. They can no longer pay attention to the truth there. Verse 10, 
Then the slave drivers and overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. Do you see the strategy here? How do you keep a people enslaved? Well, you stress them out. You make them think that rest is weak. You fill their life with noise so they can no longer hear God. And then you scatter them. You keep them isolated. Like you can't let them get together. They might encourage one another. They might foment. They might rebel against you. So ideally, the best way, if you really totally want to enslave people, is keep them isolated. Ideally, keep them at home in a room by themselves and let their only interaction with other people be through um, a tool of the devil called Zoom. That's how you keep people enslaved. Verse 13. The slave drivers kept pressing them. I'm just joking about the Zoom thing. The slave drivers kept pressing them saying, complete the work required of you each day, just as you had when you, uh, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelites, uh, Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, why, aren't you, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? So how do you keep people enslaved? I want you to hear this last point here. You give them unrealistic expectations about life, and then you heap on shame and punishment for not living up to them. Unrealistic expectations. So we could go on and on from here. Like, how do you try and keep people enslaved? But we got a pretty good list here. So let's summarize. Let's summarize where we're at just in these little bits we've covered. What's this story about? It's a literal story, right? Historical account. 3,500 years ago, God's people, they're enslaved to a king who thought he was the God of the world. And this God of the world, he, he um, turned these people made in the image of God into chattel. That's the word, animate animate tools. He devalued them. He, he dehumanized them. Their only identity was in what they could produce for him. In Pharaoh's world, you're only as good as what you can produce. In Pharaoh's world, you can never rest. So when Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, shows up and invites them to stop working and just be with him, when he values them as, as, as people made in his own image, when he calls them to join him, to become a kingdom of priests, to be his very children, when he does this, the God of the world loses his mind and does everything in his power to keep them enslaved. He, just to review, he keeps them stressed out, makes them think rest is a weakness. He fills their lives, so fills their lives with noise that they can no longer hear the truth. He keeps them isolated and then he gives them unrealistic expectations about life and then heaps on them shame for not living up to them. But then... Of course, if you know the story, Pharaoh's plan backfires. God sends down 10 spectacular plagues on Egypt, defeats Pharaoh, but not just Pharaoh, the gods of Egypt, it says. And he sets his people free that they are no longer slaves. They are beloved children. They are no longer living under Pharaoh's rule. They are no longer living under his rules. They no longer ha are what they produce, that they have value in and of themselves, innate value. They are loved by God. They are children of God. That God is their king and they are called to be a kingdom of priests, to live as royalty, to enjoy that, to delight in that. And in order to fix in their mind forever, who they are and what God has done in defeating Pharaoh, God gave them a commandment, a practice, an invitation. Every week, take a day off, 24 hours, to remember that Pharaoh is no longer your king, I'm your king. To remember you're no longer what you produce. You have, you have value because I love you. To remember how I set you free from shame and anxiety and unrealistic expectations. How I invited you to connect deeply with me and with one another. How I invited you to set aside stress. To get off this crazy loop of anxiety, of producing, of always seeking more, of endlessly serving your own desires and the desires of others. Come away with me and get real rest one full day a week. So in the teachings of Jesus and the Apostle Paul, though, we discover what you're probably already anticipating here. 
This story isn't just some story about some ancient Near Eastern people group. But according to Jesus, according to Paul, this is our story. Like Pharaoh may be a thing of the past, but the God of this world is still at work. And he's still enslaving people, still dehumanizing people, losing his mind when when people want to follow God's invitation to stop working and just be with him. In fact, I am betting, I'm betting that if you try to practice Sabbath, I mean a real Sabbath, I mean taking 24 hours off to just delight in God, to not be what you produce, to not participate in this world, to not try and keep climbing to the top of the pyramid, to not, to not view your, your neighbors as competition, to not try, and, um, uh, not try and be captured for other people's approval or be, be sucked into endless, mindless entertainment. If you do that, that you will experience, well, I, I'm guessing that you'll feel stressed out. I'm guessing that if you try and take a whole day off, you might just start think that, oh, what am I doing? This is so unproductive. This is so lazy. I'm guessing that if you, um, if you actually try and take a full day off, that your life might be so filled with noise that you can no longer hear the truth of what God's saying to you. I'm guessing that if you try and take a full day off, that you might start to feel isolated, like I'm so alone in this, like I'm, I'm missing out on any real relationships. I'm guessing that if you try and do this, you might start to have unrealistic expectations for your life, for your kids, for your career, for your spouse, and then you'll heap shame on yourself or your kids or your spouse or your co-workers. I'm guessing that if you try and take one full day off a week and experience true Sabbath, that it'll be really, really hard. Now, it could just be that you're busy or it could be that you're still experiencing slavery to the God of this world and God needs to set you free. So the good news of the book of Exodus, though, is that God specializes in this. He's already done this, right? In the book of Exodus, God defeated Pharaoh. He saved his people. He set them free. He invited them to become um, who, who they're finally called to be, not just slaves, but a kingdom of priests, his very children. And then in the New Testament, we see the same picture. That that is just a picture of what was to come. The Apostle Paul says that was a shadow, but the reality is Jesus Christ, that we see what God did in the Exodus just points us to ultimately what Jesus did on the cross for us, that we were slaves. We were, we were slaves to sin, But Jesus on the cross, he defeated the God of this world and that if we will simply accept what he did and has done for us already, that we are saved then. That it's not dependent on what we do, but on what he did. That you're no longer a slave, you're a child of God, you're royalty, you're invited to experience this rest in the same way that they were in the Old Testament. We are now fully spiritually invited to, to wholeheartedly enter into God's rest, that those words, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That invitation is still for you and for me. But, there's always a but, isn't there? If you want to experience that freedom, you have to, the biblical language is, um, repent and believe. Repentance isn't just about like feeling bad about yourself. That's not what it is. It literally means to change your mind or change your direction, to change your way of thinking or living. Like you have to stop living like a slave. If you want to experience the freedom that God has called you into, you have to stop working and acting and thinking and behaving and loving like a slave. So whatever it is that won't let you really rest, Whatever it is that won't let you just delight in God, whatever it is that won't let you Sabbath, you have to let go of that. And you have to believe. You have to believe what God says when he says that your value isn't based on what you produce or achieve or experience or own. You have to believe God when he says that you're a child of God. You have to believe God when he says that you can stop working and just trust him. You have to believe God when he says he'll give you a real rest.